In March 2009, Daniel Hannan gave a three-minute speech in the European Parliament, criticising the UK Prime Minister Gordon Brown, who had spoken earlier. The speech found its way onto YouTube and became one of those internet sensations that people like us, who produce loads of videos for YouTube, you can see our cameras around here already, uh, can only dream about. In just 24 hours, some 640,000 people have viewed it. And today the views number in the millions. I mean, seriously, it's yeah, three or four million. In Britain, it's the most watched piece of political video. What he had to say clearly struck a chord and it sure resonates here. Here's just one sentence. You cannot spend your way out of recession or borrow your way out of debt. That's a good idea. I could go on, but I urge you to find it and watch it yourself. It's very easy to find. You won't be sorry. Who's Daniel Hannan, I asked back then, and so did many others. As time has passed, we got to know. He's a conservative, um, conservative member of the European Parliament. He's previously been an advisor and speechwriter, UK ministers Michael Howell and William Hay, but his attainments go beyond the political. Born in Peru and educated in England, graduating in history from Oxford. Actually, the school he went to uh, prior to going to, to Oxford in England, his history master now lives in Perth. And uh, at the uh, luncheon we had in Perth last Monday, uh, he came along to listen, which was very nice. Um, he's established himself as a gifted writer for the press, the Telegraph in London mostly, and then longer forms, including his most recent book, how he invented freedom and why it matters. It's a, it's a compelling read and, re, and a reminder of what's important in the way we live our lives. Understanding the critical role of security of property and contract has led to modern capitalism, a source of prosperity everywhere in the world, and freedom is the key to it all. Other books include The New Road to Serfdom, a letter of warning to America. He's been named by The Telegraph as one of the 100 most influential people on the centre right in the UK over a number of years. He began his visit to Australia, in Western Australia, last Sunday, his first time there. But a distant relative had a considerable impact on that state, and any miners in, in this room will know, namely Paddy Hannon, who sparked the last great gold rush in Australia in Calgary in 1893. That particular Hannon ended up retiring to Brunswick here in Melbourne. Dan's had a very busy week in Australia, with talks of all kinds, meetings, met the Prime Minister, and many media engagements. His message has come straight from uh, John Fain's program to here. Uh, his message has been spread widely and I think has found pretty fertile soil. It would be nice if we were to spend a little bit more prospecting time here as we see, seek to crack open that mother load of freedom, so essential to our future. Ladies and gentlemen, it's my pleasure to invite Daniel Hannon to address us. Well, Greg, thank you for your kind words. And ladies and gentlemen, thank you all for coming. I am really humbled being here in this beautiful chamber as a member of the European Parliament. This is very rare for us. We don't get asked out very much. We're not generally the most popular people in Europe. And um, no, don't, don't, don't feel you've got to contradict me when I say that. I've, uh, I've become accustomed to this over the years. We have almost zero visibility, except one of my colleagues who has instant name recognition wherever he speaks. And that is a Christian Democrat from Luxembourg who glories in the name of Mr. Goebbels. And I will never forget the first occasion that Mr. Goebbels addressed the chamber in Strasbourg. I promise you this is a true story. The man in the chair was a British Labour MEP called David Martin. And when he saw the name Goebbels on the flash on the electronic board, a moment of pure faulty towers ensued. The name Go Goebbels was moving up and you could see David Martin getting more and more visibly flustered, muttering to himself, don't mention the war, don't mention the war. <laughs> and when it got to poor Mr. Goebbels' turn to speak, he was in such a state, he said, I now call Mr. Goering. I, I mean, Dr. Goebbels. I mean, Mr. Goebbels. I mean, Mr. Goebbels. Um, but for the rest of us, it's, it's wonderful to be here. So I was, how invisible I was, uh, was borne in on me very forcefully when I was first elected, and a truly extraordinary thing happened at a constituent telephone chain, almost outside the experience of an MEP. This guy called me at home, which was a number he had, 
And he said, uh, he said, are you my MEP? And I said, yes, sir, yes, I am. How wonderful to hear from you. What can I do to help? He said, oh, good. I I'm glad I've got you. It's, it's my drains. Uh, they're in a frightful state. They're all blocked up. And I, I want to know what you're going to do about it. So I didn't want to let him down. It's so rare that anybody ever contacts a member of the European Parliament. So I said, tell you what, sir, you stay on the line. I'm going to give you the number of your local authority. And the person you need to speak to there is the environmental health officer. Oh, he said, environmental health officer. Oh, no, I don't think I want to take it that high. So, um, <laughs> so it's without any, any sense of false modesty. That I, say. I tell you what is nice, though. Uh, being in Melbourne is that I have no constituents here. <laughs> none of you can vote for me, none of you can vote against me. I can say whatever I want. There is nothing like an election to remind a representative of the full wildlife, the diversity of people we represent in our constituents. I can see one or two legislators or ex-legislators in the room and they're being polite and I can see them nodding inwardly. The last election I was canvassing in a small uh, rural, remote part of Hampshire, and I came across a, a farmer who had a concern about Brussels banning a substance he was putting in his feed. He told me this story. He'd spent a fortune on a pedigree bull, which wouldn't do the business, wouldn't serve any of his heifers. And he bought this substance, stirred it in, and bingo, the bull couldn't get enough of it. All the cows were in calf. He was absolutely delighted. And now he'd heard that Brussels was trying to prohibit on health grounds, this chemical. I said, what is the chemical name, sir? He said, well, I can't rightly tell you what it's called, but I can tell you that it tastes of aniseed. <laughs> I'm canvassing in a small town in Surrey. This is a, the, the most extraordinary. One door was opened by a little boy who must have been nine or ten years old, and he was wearing a great smoking jacket hanging loosely from his little shoulders. In one hand, he was swirling a balloon of brandy about the size of his little head. In the other hand, it was a very expensive smelling, slowly smoldering Cuban cigar. Well, as you do when you're handsing, I leaned down and I said, are your parents at home? And this little lad said, does it effing look as though my parents are <laughs> This is a country which does not have the problems that other places have. I know that a lot of people in this room are coalition supporters, conservatives. I think we are sometimes too gloomy. It's part of the conservative temperament. We focus on all the things that are going wrong. And of course, there are lots of things going wrong if you are a right of center person. But believe me, there are not many places in the world that would not gladly swap their problems for Australians. And that didn't just happen on its own. It happened because there were far-sighted people making the argument and winning the debate. And a number of those people are here, and Greg has been an especially honorable combatant in that battle for the last four decades. As Greg has just said, I've seen a lot of this great continent of yours. I was in Perth, I was in Sydney, I was in Canberra. Of course, all my conservative friends said, why do you want to go to Canberra? What's the point of that? I mean, any of you who have been there will, will have, I'm sure, had this as well. Well, there were two reasons that I was very keen uh, to go to camp. The first is that I have not had a chance since your general election to congratulate or to thank your Prime Minister, who is a transformative figure. And again, this is worth saying because I, I, a lot of my younger conservative friends in Australia say, well, he's got this wrong and he's got that wrong and he's not a proper free trader and so on. Do you know what? When you're very close up to the movie star, you can see that her skin is not perfect beneath the makeup. You focus on the things that are going wrong. And if you're a proper young movement conservative, in a way, fine. That's your job. That's what you're supposed to do. I used to do the same when I was a student under Margaret Thatcher. I focused on the things she could be doing better. Now, after her death, I can see with the perspective of time what I can see about Tony Abbott with the perspective of distance. This is a statesman of the first rank who, in his generosity, in the largeness of his character, in his unstinting integrity, in his unfeigned informality and decency, embodies all the best qualities of the great country that he is privileged to lead.
And I wanted to go to Canberra for another reason. This is the furthest you can go from Runnymede and find a near original 13th century copy of Magna Carta. Magna Carta is the foundation of what we understand, we who speak this language, as constitutional government and the liberty of the individual. It's, it's the Torah of the English-speaking peoples. At once, the text that sets us apart and one that has universal truths for mankind. Lord Denning, perhaps the greatest jurist of the 20th century in Britain, said it was the greatest document ever conceived the greatest constitutional document ever, read, ever written, the supreme guarantor of personal freedom against the arbitrary authority of the despot. In the 18th century, John Wilkes described it as the characteristic of all Englishmen, by which, of course, he meant all English speakers in those days, except Scots, who he eccentrically thought were Tory and absolutist by nature, odd as that seems from our present perspective. What's special about Magna? It's the phrase, the law of the land, that extraordinary concept, that supreme power is not the will of the king or the biggest person in the tribe, but that above the king is something infinitely more powerful. You can't see it, you can't taste it or touch it, but it binds the sovereign as surely as it binds the poorest man in the kingdom. Many years later, John Adams, when he was putting together the state constitution of Massachusetts, came up with the wonderful phrase, a government of laws, not of men. Actually, those words were not his. He was quoting a 17th century English Whig called James Harrington, further demonstration of the deep shared roots of Anglosphere liberties. But think of that amazing concept that the law doesn't come from the king, or from God, that it resides in the people, in a way whose evolution now nobody really can understand. Nobody can tell you when the common law began. We inherited from our parents, they from theirs, and so on and so on, until some remote period in the Dark Ages. Every other civilization, when it comes to writing down laws, enshrining legal systems, does the, the logical thing, does what you'd expect. You write down a law in the abstract, first principles, and then you apply it to specific cases. We, English-speaking peoples, miraculously, bizarrely, beautifully and anomalously came up with a system where the law grew like a coral reef, like the Great Barrier Reef, state, uh, case by case, each judgment serving as the starting point of the next one. It was the property of the people, not of the state. It came up from the population not down from the government, and therefore it assumed personal freedom and residual rights. To put it more demotically, we assume that if something is not expressly prohibited by law, we can do whatever we bloody well like. And from that basic difference in the relationship between state and citizen flow the liberties and indeed the prosperity that we enjoy to this day. Every year, the Heritage Foundation publishes a list of the freest economies, a league table of the freest economies on the planet. And this is how the top of the list looks in 2014. Hong Kong, Singapore, Australia, New Zealand, Switzerland, Canada. Only in the present age would anyone think it impolitic or impolite to point out what five of those six countries have in common. Plainly, there is something in the Anglosphere model of dispersed power, personal freedom, sanctity of contract that militates in favour of freedom and prosperity. Magna Carta was sealed in my constituency. Runnymede is part of the area I represent. The site where that little secular miracle took place 800 years ago went completely unmarked until 1956 when a memorial stone was finally erected there by the American Bar Association. <laughs> the cousins have always taken the Great Charter much more seriously than we have. 
Alongside the copy in Canberra, there are four original or near original copies, two in the British Library, one in Salisbury Cathedral, one in Lincoln Cathedral. You can go and look at them. There's no particular fuss. There's no chains keeping you away. There's no queue. When the copy from Lincoln Cathedral was exhibited in New York in 1939, 14 million people crushed in to see it. The Second World War broke out while it was still on display. It was transferred to Fort Knox for safekeeping, where it remained for the duration of the war as the aptest imaginable symbol of what the English-speaking peoples were fighting for. The mistake we can so easily make in any age and nation is to become blasé about what is familiar, to take for granted the things that we grew up with. We can so easily fall into thinking that personal freedom and representative government, equality between men and women, jury trials, habeas corpus, the rule of law, that these things are the natural condition of humanity. That every nation will get there when it becomes wealthy enough and educated enough. History tells us a very different story. Those precepts were overwhelmingly evolved in the language which I'm now talking about. Call them Western values, we sometimes even call them universal values, but frankly, we're being polite. The reason they became Western values, if we're going to be blunt about this, is as the result of a series of military victories by the English-speaking peoples. You don't have to go back all that far to find a time when these principles were confined to the Anglo to the community of free English-speaking democracies. Let me take you back to the 10th of August, 1941, day that Franklin Roosevelt made the longest walk of his presidency. Up until then, for two decades, in a way that would be literally unthinkable today, the American media had contrived to hide the fact of their president's polio from the population. Photographs always showed FDR seated or standing unaided. But that day, invited by Winston Churchill to join him on the decks of HMS Prince of Wales off Newfoundland, Roosevelt was determined literally to rise to the occasion. Leaning heavily on his walking stick, supported on one side by his son and on the other by a naval officer, he made his slow way across the deck as the band of HMS Prince of Wales struck up the Stars and Stripes prayer. And what followed was the most extraordinary demonstration of what binds the English seeking peoples together and what we were fighting for in that terrible Conflagration. Churchill knew that he couldn't just appeal to Roosevelt as one democratic leader to another. Roosevelt was contending with a neutrality that had been decreed by the Republic's founders and reinforced in a series of neutrality acts in the 1930s. Churchill needed to show that wider consanguinity, that deeper cultural affinity upon which the alliance of the English-speaking peoples would rest. It was the Sunday morning, and the crews of the two vessels, the USS Augusta, which had brought Roosevelt, and HMS Prince of Wales, were paraded for a joint religious service. Churchill had chosen every detail, personally and meticulously, down to the hymns that were to be sung, down to the reading which the chaplain gave from the pulpit. It came from Joshua 1. As I was with Moses, so will I be with thee. I will not fail thee nor forsake thee. Be strong and of good courage. And afterwards, Churchill exulted to an aid the same language, the same hymns, the same ideals. And when he said the same ideals, he wasn't making some bland generalization about being the goodies. Think of the world as it appeared from the perspective of August 1941. The whole of the Eurasian landmass, from Brest and Lisbon down to Seoul and Vladivostok was under one form or another of authoritarianism. 
No one saw our system, what the Nazis and the communists alike called Anglo-Saxon capitalism or Anglo-Saxon liberalism. Nobody saw it as a coming force. Look at the adjectives that our enemies used. It was decadent. It was dissolute. It was rotten. Everyone assumed that it was on its way out. How could a system that elevates the individual over the collective possibly triumph against systems that do the opposite, that elevate martial glory and collective endeavor over privacy and freedom? Of course, our system did triumph. It carried its foes before it. And from then, we started calling the values of your system and ours Western values. They're much stronger here than they are in my home country. Every British visitor feels touched by the melancholy as he makes this observation here. Individual responsibility, personal freedom, dispersal of power, these are precepts that have found much surer roots in the rich red soil of this continent than in the Soviet Union. British Isles. Maybe that was true right from the beginning. When the first settlers came here, they had a way of organizing their affairs. They had a, a concept of the relationship between state and individual, but they found themselves with opportunities that they had lacked in the places they'd come from. Here was plentiful land, the opportunity to spread out and become proprietors, no ghosts of a feudal aristocracy. The values that had once been remarked on by foreign visitors from Europe to Britain, the things that were thought to set the British Isles apart, the individualism, the bloody-mindedness, the stubbornness, the meritocracy, the in what we would now call the libertarianism, these things were exaggerated and intensified here. Australia became not a spillover Britain, but an intensified Anglosphere. It carried to a higher plane the values of personal liberty that had traditionally characterized our civilization. But the real divergence between Britain and the rest of the Anglosphere came about only in the last four decades when we made the calamitous decision to accept a foreign legal system as superior to our own. Our father's decision to join the European Economic Community, as it then was, I know it worked out badly for you and for our other kinsmen around the planet. And it's no consolation when I say it worked out much more badly for us. Australia bounced back extremely impressively. Britain has not. The year that we joined, 1973, Western Europe accounted for 36% of the world's GDP. Today that figure is 24%, and in 2020 it will be 15%. We thought we were joining a growing, prosperous market. In truth, we were confining ourselves in a cramped and dwindling customs union. Thought we were hitching our wagon to a powerful economic locomotive. In fact, we shackled ourselves to a course. At the very moment that the takeoff was beginning in the rest of the world, not least the markets of the Commonwealth and the wider Anglosphere. According to the IMF, the Commonwealth will grow at 7.2% per year for the next five years. The Eurozone will not grow at all. This is not a place to be if you are an island without great natural resources that depends on buying and selling. I write a blog for the Daily Telegraph and I made a throwaway comment a few weeks ago. I said every continent on Earth is now growing economically except Antarctica and Europe. And a Spanish friend got in touch very crossly, and he sent me lots of detailed statistics, and I had to accept that he was right. He pointed out that Antarctica is doing fine. Uh, <laughs> cruise ships are coming back, and the Antarctican economy is rebounding in line with everyone else's. We are trapped in the only customs union on the planet that is shrinking. This can't carry on. We've given away our sovereignty, our right to hire and fire our lawmakers, and in return, we have ended up with less prosperity than we would have had as a trading people, as a maritime people, connected by our enterprising energies to every continent. We need to raise our eyes to more distant horizons and rediscover that global vocation that our fathers took for granted. And it will come. And it may come sooner 
than you think. And the day it happens, the day we leave the European Union, the first thing I want us to do is to restore free movement to citizens of Australia and New Zealand. I've always found it deeply obnoxious that people from this part of the world, with as strong a claim on our friendship as any country can have on another's, are expected to queue up with everybody else, with all the rest of the world's citizens, while, to put this as neutrally as I can, citizens of countries with less of a recent claim on our friendship are able to sail through unchecked. This is not about symbolism in airports. It's about control of who comes into the country. At the moment, as an EU member state, we cannot regulate inward migration from other EU countries. We have to take unlimited numbers of Romanians, Bulgarians, whatever. And yet, Australians and New Zealanders are chased away at the end of their two-year visa. Well, actually, they're not. They're very good at evading the system. But it's still outrageous in principle that they are subject to being chased away on the expiry of their visas. This is no way to treat a friend. Like every British visitor to Australia, I'm moved more than I can say by the immensity of your warm words, by the thought of those hundreds of thousands of young men who crossed half the world to take up arms for a country on which in most cases they've never set eyes because they believed that it stood for a better system than the alternative. 400,000 Australian volunteers in the Great War, nearly a million in the Second World War. And the greatest of those war memorials is, of course, the one here in Melbourne. And it ends in the inscription on the, the West Face, ye therefore that come after, give remembrance. Remembrance for what? What was it that those men were prepared to fight for? Was it only coincidence of language? Was it only family links? And of course, that was part of it. But if that's all it was, if the First and Second World Wars were simply ethnic conflagrations, then they were no different in character from the breakup of Yugoslavia or the Hutu Tutsi massacres in Rwanda. Look at what the participants themselves thought they were fighting for. They understood that theirs was a free system, that they were in the slogan of the day fighting for freedom. They could have expressed it in a thousand different ways. But there was an unmissable conviction that the Anglosphere model that elevates the law above the government, that elevates the individual above the state rather than doing the reverse, was a better model than any rival. One worth defending and one worth, in the last analysis, dying. That's a story we should not be ashamed to pass on to our kids. They are not just a random set of individuals born to another random set of individuals. They are the inheritors of a sublime tradition that has served to elevate and ennoble our species, to lift us to a pinnacle of wealth that previous generations would have thought impossible, that have given us freedom, happiness and individual liberty. Not a bad story. A patrimony that's worth keeping intact and handing on securely to those who come next. Ye therefore who come after, give remembrance.